And this is Bloomberg Technology coming up. In the next hour, Turkey's president calls for a boycott of American-made electronics in response to U.S. sanctions. What a prolonged crisis in the country could mean for the iPhone and more. Plus, Elon Musk and Tesla's board form a committee to go over the Go Private plans. But Musk says he's now being advised by Goldman Sachs and Silver Lake as critics continue to doubt his transparency. Does one of the most high profile and youngest players in the NBA balance his game on and off the court? We'll sit down with Jalen Brown of the Boston Celtics. But first to our top story, President Erdogan remained defiant in response to U.S. sanctions in Turkey, vowing to boycott American electronics like the iPhone and stand firm in the face of what he calls an explicit economic attack. Here's what he had to say at a speech in Ankara. Every single product we buy from abroad should be produced by ourselves and we sell them to others instead of buying them from others. Electronic products of USA, we will boycott them. The U.S. showed no signs of relenting, warning there will be no negotiations about sanctions until a detained American pastor is released, according to Bloomberg reporting. Bloomberg Daybreak's Middle East anchor Yusuf Gamal al-Din had this recap from Istanbul. A series of speeches defined the conversation around Turkey in the last few hours, starting off with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He made it clear that he felt the U.S. was responsible for a lot of the recent turmoil. He said that Turkey has come under a coordinated attack and that it would do everything in its power to defend itself. And as a result of all of this, he added that they would be boycotting American products and shifting specifically away from iPhones to other alternatives like Samsung's and domestic options as well. We heard from the finance minister. He chipped in and called the U.S. dollar a tool of political punishment. And that shows you how the broad conversation has perhaps escalated just a little bit of a notch. And we'll have to wait and see whether the United States responds again, either with sanctions or tariffs. We did see a recovery in Turkish assets, stocks, bonds, and the lira did post a bit of a rebound, but liquidity is thin, so that's not necessarily the best reflection of the realities of the market. The coming hours are going to be a real test for the country as it looks for sustainability in a lot of these trades, but also credibility among international investors. In Istanbul, for Bloomberg News, I'm Yusuf Gamedidi. For more, I want to bring in our Bloomberg TV Markets editor, Romaine Bostic, and here with me in San Francisco, Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman, who of course covers Apple and consumer electronics. How big, Mark, is Apple in Turkey? You know, they're not that big. Their market share in terms of smartphone OS usage, iOS, is very small. It's sub 20%, so it's not very significant. But this news is very significant optically. Now people are saying, hmm, why is the iPhone banned in Turkey all of a sudden? People who don't understand the trade situation, right? But what if this is also the start of a new thing where different countries are asking Apple to build iPhones locally, or they're going to start making it more difficult for them to sell? We've seen this in India already. Now we have the China and U.S. trade war, and now we have Turkey. So is this going to continue? to be a domino effect, and we'll see more of this in the future. That's the problem. Tim Cook, uh, Apple CEO, did meet with President Trump over the weekend. Here's a clue on what might have been discussed. Uh, Tim Cook did address uh, the trade dispute on the earnings call a couple of weeks ago. Take a listen to what he had to say. Our view on tariffs is that uh, they uh, show up as, as a uh, tax on the consumer and uh, wind up resulting in lower economic growth and, and uh, sometimes can bring about significant uh, risk of unintended consequences. Uh, that said, the, the trade relationships and agreements that the U.S. has between, uh, with, between the U.S. and other major economies are very complex, and it's clear that several are, are in need of modernizing. In need 
afraid of modernizing. So Romaine, Tim Cook sort of hedging a little bit there. What do you imagine uh, transpired in this conversation with the president and how much sway does a company like Apple have as the most valuable company in the world? Well, it's the most valuable company in the world. It's also a major employer and it has a major economic impact, not just on California, but on a lot of other states as well. And I think Tim Cook knows that. Also, I should point out too that this isn't unusual. Anytime you have a CEO of one of the largest companies in the world, uh, you think back in the past, whether it was names like General Electric or Boeing, other companies that were sort of at the top, they all had to have good relationships with the administration that was in power at the time uh, in the interest of sort of furthering their business and really just making sure that the economic environment was stable enough to sort of facilitate whatever it was they were trying to sell. So uh, the president of Turkey ha has called for Turkish citizens to buy Venus smartphones, which are made by Vestal Electronics. They're pretty excited. How do their products compare to the iPhone? Oh, I mean, it's totally two different worlds, right? The iPhone is this premium product, while these Venus smartphones are a bit lower end, more mass consumer. And if you think about the iPhone market in Turkey, I saw a stat today on Bloomberg indicating that an iPhone 10, obviously a thousand in the U.S., significantly more in Turkey, it's about 5x uh, the cost of the average income on a, a monthly basis for some people uh, in Turkey, or people on minimum wage income in Turkey. So the, the iPhone 10 is is not an affordable phone per se. Certainly not affordable in the U.S., but definitely not affordable to many uh, in Turkey. Apple doesn't have as much distribution as they do in other places. Only two Apple stores across Turkey. So in the long, in the scheme of things right now, not in the long term, in the short term, it's not a big deal. But I think the big problem long term is if other countries start, you know, tacking on to this and are asking Apple to build things locally. So, Romaine, you know, given the strength of the Turkish lira in general, what is the actual purchasing power of, you know, people living in the country to even buy American electronics in general? Yeah, well, it's not high. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, Mark just talked about the, the five times, uh, uh, you know, the, what the income is there. I mean, keep in mind that right now an iPhone 10, the very the lowest model there uh, would be about 7,500 lira at today's exchange rate. That's somewhere around 12 or 1,300 U.S. dollars. So uh, pretty pricey, uh, particularly for an economy that just really isn't at the same level as the U.S. But keep in mind, even for other electronics, uh, this really isn't a big market for imported electronics. I mean, when you think about the amount of uh, products that Turkey imports from the U.S., electronics is about a tenth of that, less than a tenth of that really and when you get into things like smartphones and other thing it's much less than that so this isn't really an economy that was really in a position to afford a lot of these higher end models to begin with and now with the depreciation of the currency uh, it's looking less likely that they would be able to afford it uh, given uh, all that's happened so I think that uh, the uh, the message from Erdogan is sort of moot to a certain uh, extent uh, at least until this economy gets back back on track most of its citizens probably aren't going to be able to afford these products same mark for broader American electronics outside of Apple? Right. The prices, because of the exchange rate with the Turkish lira, makes a lot of these high-end electronics simply unaffordable to many people in Turkey. And Apple's had their struggles in Turkey. This isn't the first time they had to deal with it. I'm really looking at this from the long term, the long game right now. How is this going to affect Apple in many other countries, ones that are more important to them than Turkey? So perhaps these threats more bark than bite. Um, I do want to stay on Apple for a moment, though. Hedge fund manager David Einhorn, Einhorn sold shares of Apple in the second quarter before it crossed that $1 trillion threshold. Einhorn, who runs Greenlight Capital, trimmed his stake in Apple by 486,000 shares, reducing his position to about $26 million. That's according to regulatory filings. Now, Romain, we are expecting to see more of these 13F filings in the next few days. Do you think we'll see more of the same from other big tech hedge funds? Well, it'll be interesting. I did take a look uh, uh, earlier today. I mean, you did get a couple other hedge funds like Piedmont, which did have a significant reduction in their holdings. The green light one was a little interesting, especially considering Einhorn is considered a value investor. Uh, you know, it's not clear why he got out of this position, but he's really been on the wrong sides of a lot of trades this year, including on Tesla and on GM. But as we get more of these filings, I think you have to keep in mind that the shares did have a pretty good run prior to the end of the second quarter. So it wouldn't be uh, surprising to see uh, some hedge funds sort of, you know, cash in their chips. Uh, you know, you could have easily looked at this stock at the end of June and thought that was the top. There's really not much more higher this is going to get. Of course, they would have been proven wrong, but it's not like they lost money on this trade. Apple was a fantastic trade for the past couple of years, uh, which is the time frame that a lot of these funds were in it.
Tim Cook, though, has made it clear he's continuing to look for uh, long-term investors. Okay, Bloomberg's Romain Bostic as well as Mark Gurman. Thank you both. Coming up, Bloomberg is hosting the second annual Players Technology Summit. We're going to speak to Jalen Brown of the Boston Celtics, who's making big moves on and off the court. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. The second annual Players Tech Summit hosted by Bloomberg is underway. It is an exclusive gathering of world-class athletes, entrepreneurs, and investors taking place right here in San Francisco. Since my next guest joined the NBA in 2016 playing for the Boston Celtics, he quickly made an impression on and off the court. Jalen Brown uh, with us here now. So you're 21 years old. Yes. You've obviously made impression in, in the basketball world itself. But you also interned at a venture capital fund. You hosted a tech summit. What are your goals off the court? Um, that's a long-winded <laughs> <laughs> type of question, but um, just basically just build like a, a Rolodex and also educate myself a little bit and, and find the right resources to put myself in a position to be a little bit more successful than I was last year and the year before that. So what have you actually done so far? I know you're educating yourself, you're talking to people, you're not investing quite yet, but you're getting ready. I've done a little bit of everything. Like I've, um, I gave a, a, a lecture at Harvard on education uh, not too long ago as well and talking about some of the uses of um, connecting a lot of worlds between like basketball and, and education and technology, how that can be a bridge between the two. And um, I think it was the youngest, I was the youngest lecturer ever in Harvard history. And I think it did the most numbers. I think it did like half a million to a million views. Uh, Facebook, between Facebook, the Harvard page and things like that. So uh, I've been trying to keep myself up, up to date. So most athletes wouldn't start thinking about this until further into their career, their athletic career, their second career. Mm -hmm. why, are you, why are you thinking about this now? Um, I think leverage is now, especially while you're playing and while you're young. I think that, uh, pretty much the reason why I'm probably here is because I'm 21 years old and um, I'm mature enough to be in a space and, and talk about education and talking about um, investing and venture capitalism, et cetera. But uh, when you stop playing, I think your leverage kind of goes out the window. Uh, while you're playing, I think um, you, you have a little bit more leverage and you can sit down with more people and being 21, everybody wants their hands on like what they think, what the future might be. The, the future is key. So being young, you have a lot of influence and a lot of leverage. So how do you maintain focus on the game, on the court? At the same time, you had a great postseason. Mm -hmm. but it's going to be a tough upcoming season if you're going to maintain that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a balance. Life is about balance. Like, basketball is my craft. It's the thing that I do. But outside the basketball court, you do have some free time. You know, I'm a human being just like everybody else. Just like everybody else has a day job, and they go enjoy watching sports. Sports is my day job, and I and go enjoy doing other things as well, like investing, educating myself, giving speeches, and being here. What kind of investments or areas are you excited about? Um, I'm, I'm so curious about a lot of different things. Um, I've been hearing, I've been reading, doing a lot of reading about the online gambling mm -hmm. scene. I'm curious to see where that goes. Um, you probably know a little bit more about it than I do, like the insights, but I'm super curious to see where that goes. And, and just hearing about the new technology that's going to be you know, prevalent in the next few years. I'm actually curious to hear what you think, given that several of the barriers to sports gambling are now dropping. What do you think the role of players should be in that? That's the part that I'm curious about. <laughs> I was going to ask you the same <laughs> question, but um, I am not sure. Like when a lot of money gets involved and things like that, like gambling was already a billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. And like it wasn't even legal, legalized, like federally. Now it is. I'm curious to see where that goes. What about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? I'm still having, I'm, I'm, they're giving a, a panel discussion downstairs on crypto. I'm missing it right now, and I'm actually could learn a little bit more about it. But um, I was just uh, explained like how it kind of works. It's like a big chains and cryptocurrency and things like that. And it's like what my understanding is a lot of people behind a lot of computers, and they're working together and trying to like rectify and make money and things like that. But it's not the easiest thing to understand, I'll tell you that. Well, I'm moderating that panel, so I will be asking for some crypto one-on-one -on -one lessons for all of us. Um, it's going to be a big season coming up. LeBron James has gone to the Lakers. How does that change the game on the court? 
Uh, I definitely think, um, you know, LeBron has had a, a, a stronghold on the East for seven years. Like, these, they, they've won every year. So now, I guess teams feel like it's up in the air. You know, it's our job to come in and be like, nah, the Celtics are going to be the team to hold it down for the next five to seven to ten years or however long. Mark Gurman, who I was just speaking with as he was getting off the set, made a prediction. Celtics Warriors in the finals next year. What do you think? As long as the Celtics are in that conversation, <laughs> I can care less what we plan. Um, you know, you're an incredibly young player, as, as many have pointed out. What do you think about the current sort of controversy around age limits in the NBA? Do you think you, at your young age, should have been allowed and able to go right into the NBA when you did? I definitely think so. I think the argument would be if you can serve your country at 18, why not be able to play basketball? Right. I think that's the argument everybody talks about. But the NBA is its own foundation, so they can make the rules that they want. But I think that if they lift that limit, I think you'll see some some interesting stories and then some kids if they're ready. It's only it's only going to be like one or two kids that are going to be ready for the NBA per year. So um, because the talent level is so good, like an NBA, if they're ready, why not let them come out? Well, there's the sort of being physically ready, but then there's also the emotional readiness mm. and the responsibility that comes with it. How do you sort of rise up to the responsibility of being, you know, an NBA player um, at just 21 years old? What's that like? It, it could be overwhelming at times, I could tell you that. Being in a, a new atmosphere, a new environment, not too sure what's going on or what is how everything works and you're just you can easily be influenced by the wrong things especially being young and 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 trying to gravitate or fit in into what you think the NBA lifestyle is and, and, and it's it could be one or two things it could be good or it could be bad and it's just based on how you govern yourself so how have you governed yourself <laughs> um, I've made mistakes I'll be the first I've made mistakes I've um, had to figure things out. I've, had, I've done things like um, I had to sit down and evaluate how I spend my time. You have time that people don't realize, but the way you spend it is is, is crucial. Like um, you have to, people have to find athletes have to find their interests outside of sports. You know, if you don't have any interests outside of what you do, once you're off the floor, you're going to be bored. You know, a lot of times people do things out of boredom. And for me, finding what I've been interested in and 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 like attacking it has been key for me. So uh, we've seen the intersection of sports and politics, especially with the musings of President Trump on Twitter. Um, LeBron James recently criticized the president in an interview on CNN. The president responded also um, insulting the CNN anchor, Don Lemon, saying LeBron James was just interviewed by the dumbest man on television, Don Lemon. He made LeBron look smart, which isn't easy to do. I like Mike, reference to Michael Jordan. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, my thoughts. Another uh, <laughs> long-winded question. I think it's, it's interesting. I think I don't know if it's propaganda, if it's for media attention, but it's it's interesting to see you know our president, supposed to be the leader of our troops, handle his, himself in in such a manner. You know, it's almost like. Um, a high school type of scenario I like Mike or I don't like him like his choosing a companion or, or something like that it's, it's just weird for me to see that you know I would expect more from the president that's supposed to be in charge of our country you know I wouldn't expect these type of actions but you know everybody has their own way of handling themselves so I let him do him um, we've certainly seen players and teams speak out against the president I mean do you think that he is trying to use sports to divide the country I am not sure. That's a question I would have to ask. Somebody would have to ask him. I would say he's doing a good job of making a lot of people upset. <laughs> I would say that, but um, sports is a, is, a, is, a, is a unique thing in our country. It's so influential. It's almost like a, a sacrament for religion. People praise like um, LeBron James more than they praise anybody else, you know? And sports is so powerful, you know? And I think he realizes that, and I think um, that's where the, the conflict begins. Do you see yourself speaking up and speaking out where you feel it's necessary? Do you think that's one of your responsibilities as a player, as a role model? Um, I don't know if responsibility is the right word, but I definitely feel like you have uh, influence. 
and then you have to have a lot of people that are following behind you. You know, so I'm 21 years old, and I'm thinking about the kids that are from my neighborhood, from my community, that are looking up to me and seeing me handle myself a certain way. So I, I do feel a responsibility in that sense to handle myself a certain way in front of those guys. But in terms of to engage into like the president's shenanigans, I don't necessarily just feel, feel a responsibility for that. So if you're back here in a year when you're 22 years young, What's going to happen for you this year? What's next for Jalen Brown? What's next for Jalen Brown? <laughs> I'm in the works. I'm, I'm figuring things out. I'm learning different things right here. I see the two things I always say. Either I'm the fly on the wall or I'm the elephant in the room. So uh, right now I'm the fly on the wall. So <laughs> I'm just learning and uh, enjoying that. All right. Well, we will see you down there. Jalen Brown, Boston Celtics, thank you so much thank you. for joining us. Much more coming up, and remember, Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Technology, and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Francisco, a lot of tech action today. Our top stories this morning in D.C. and the Dow and the S&P. Shall we? So the euro on a seven-day winning streak. Sizable moves in the currency market. Just down half. We floor. begin in the oil patch. Saudi Arabia. Brent crude. Oil pretty much unchanged. Welcome to Bloomberg, the first word Asia. We U.S. Are. and Japan do get out over exchange. China slumping on short bond market. has fallen to its lowest level since June. The cryptocurrency extending its slide, dropping below $6,000. Dozens of other digital tokens falling as well. Bitcoin and its peers had rallied last month on hopes that a new ETF would attract new investors to the world of digital currencies. But U.S. regulators haven't signed off quite yet. A group of Tinder founders, execs, and early employees have sued IAC and Match Group, claiming the owners of the dating app are trying to cheat them out of billions of dollars in options. The group, which includes former CEO Sean Rad, claim IAC and Match created an artificially low valuation of Tinder to avoid paying the group money they're due under options agreements. And NVIDIA has unveiled its first new graphics processor in two years. They'll be used for computer workstations and servers used to produce movies and design cars. The chipmaker said the new capabilities will drastically shorten production times. And coming up, Tesla's board steps in what they plan to do as Elon Musk continues to tweet his plans to take Tesla private. That's next. And later in the program, Google's privacy problem, the company's software, helps get you where you want to go, but it is always tracking you, even when you tell it not to. We'll discuss. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Now to the continued saga of Elon Musk wanting to take Tesla private once again. On Tuesday, Tesla's board stepped in, announcing it created a special committee to review Musk's idea. The group, made up of three independent directors, has, quote, the full power and authority of the board to evaluate and negotiate any potential transaction to take Tesla private. Tesla stopped short of giving any assurances they will follow through on Musk's proposal. Here to discuss, Bloomberg opinion columnist Stephen Gandal, who covers banking and equity markets. So, Stephen, what do you make of the moves we are seeing now? Now, in retrospect, from the board, almost a full week after that initial tweet. Well, they're in a tricky situation, right? Because, well, now Musk is under investigation, and that's going to be make it harder for even if they had, which it clearly sounds like it wasn't, even if funding was secured, uh, if you're going to come in with whatever they'd need, $20 million, billion, uh, it's going to be a lot harder for someone to, it's going to be a lot harder to get something willing to come in with that money with the CEO under investigation. The other problem they have is that if they go through with the transaction, now that there's been some airing that, you know, Musk hadn't really thought this through, at least part of it was to get back at the shorts, they could be sued 
sued um, if the transaction goes bad. Let's talk a little bit about the potential ramifications here. We heard earlier from a former SEC attorney. Take a listen to what she had to say. He's still subject to the same ramifications that we initially thought that he could be. Making an untrue statement when you don't have a reasonable basis and that's going to impact the securities markets and people are going to rely on that, that is still a violation of the anti-fraud rules. And in addition, uh, making any kind of a statement as to a tender offer and whether or not you believe that you're going to actually follow through with the tender offer, that's another violation. As you said, Stephen, it seems like funding wasn't actually secured, but that Elon thought he could secure the funding if he wanted to. He's, he's, he's dropped uh, names like the Saudi Investment Fund, but uh, the New York Times is reporting that sources on that side say there was no paperwork right. being done directionally uh, in terms of a potential deal, and also that the board was taken by surprise. All of this put together, what are the possible ramifications here for Elon Musk? Well, I think even if he can, if he, even if he can get over the funding secured, which is a high bar, but even if he can get over that, he has a problem really, and it's even a bigger problem, I guess, with that second tweet. There was a second tweet that said that the deal's got to go, uh, is all ready to go, all we need is shareholder approval. Well, if the Saudis were the ones that were going to do the going private transaction, there would have had to be some regulatory oversight. There would have been a, a vote on whether a foreign entity could take over um, Tesla. So. That, it doesn't save him having the, the Saudis as the potential funder. And I think, I think he's, I don't know if it's a criminal investigation. I mean, we, I've had a debate with a few of my colleagues whether this crossover into criminal investigation, because I think for it to be a criminal thing, I think he had to be cashing out his shares on the tweet. But it's definitely, it seems like market manipulation, and um, that's a securities fraud. And he could see himself uh, removed for a certain period of time, maybe temporarily, not be allowed to be a uh, executive of a publicly traded company. He could, you know, like Martha Stewart, he could be banned uh, from being a, 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 an executive of a publicly traded company. Meantime, he's continuing to trickle out more specifics on Twitter, earlier saying he's excited to work with Silver Lake and Goldman Sachs as financial advisors. He also named a couple of law firms. You point out in your piece that while Elon Musk's biggest problem may be that Tesla is a public company, Tesla's biggest problem is Elon Musk. Explain. Well, it's, it was true before, but it's certainly true now in the fact that, um, as I said, it's going to be harder to do this transaction. Even if they, he could have done the transaction before, it's going to be even harder to do this transaction because anyone's going to be worried that he might be separated from the company. And then you're, Elon Musk and, and Tesla are intertwined, right? That's part of the excitement, both of them, uh, him being there to see through his vision. And a, a private company is not going to want, a private investor, sorry, was not going to want to get into this to the tunes of tens of billions of dollars if he may be removed. But it's just that as a public company, it's done well. I mean, he hates the criticism, but, you know, it trades at 140 times next year's earnings, right? The public markets like Tesla. He doesn't like the criticism, but the public markets like Tesla. It's not clear. And, I, and again, I don't know what the stock would do absent of this uh, private equity deal, uh, a pro going private deal. I don't know what the stock would do, but I think it's a better public company than it is a private company where it's mostly got the cold shoulder um, from the debt markets. I mean, they did a big offering, but it's, tr it's traded down. So that said, he's, he's naming some legitimate financial advisors. What's the over-under? Well, sure. I mean, but yeah, once he puts his hand up, <laughs> sorry, once he puts his hand up, all the people are going to jump in. There's potential for fees here, right? So they're going to jump in. But, you know, Silver Lake uh, has said that, yes, they're working with Musk, but they're not taking any fee and it's not a real assignment. So it's hard to gauge what this, this latest tweet about the advisors means. So what's the over-under on whether he can get this done? Oh, uh, nothing. I mean, <laughs> there is, it is no shot it gets done. There's no shot anyone puts their money in. The, in the way that he's done this, he, he can't get it done. I mean, it was a hard deal anyway because he ha would have had to come up with this kind of very weird uh, structure because he wasn't going to come up with a full $70 billion. It couldn't take any more, on, any more debt. So it's going to have to be this kind of public-private hybrid. That's going to be hard anyway. Now it's going to be really hard with an SEC investigation. And then lastly, as I pointed out, if the board goes through with it, they kind of look like they're going through with it just to save his ass. And if the transaction goes poorly, then uh, they're going to be sued as well. All right, leaving us with no doubt as to what your thoughts are, Stephen Gandell of Bloomberg Opinion. Thank you so much. Now, 
Musk made headlines this week beyond Tesla introducing the next generation of U.S. space flight. Believe it or not, SpaceX unveiled its Crew Dragon spaceship capsule for the first time to reporters at its Hawthorne, California headquarters on Monday and the four astronauts that will fly it. Crew Dragon is SpaceX's partnership with NASA's commercial crew program, the agency's solution to once again launch U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil. The aim is to have the first crewed launch in April. Here to discuss, Marco Casera, senior analyst for space studies at the Teal Group. We're going to get to the, the Tesla take private uh, questions in a moment, Marco. But first of all, NASA just gave assignments for the first nine astronauts riding commercial spacecraft. Five of them went to Boeing and four of them went to SpaceX. How big a deal is that? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a big deal because it takes us um, into a whole new era. Um, we've been uh, basically, uh, the United States has been uh, renting space on uh, Soyuz uh, rockets and capsules to get our astronauts up to the space station for the last uh, uh, seven or eight years. And, uh, and for the first time in a while now, we have the opportunity to, uh, to launch our own astronauts on our own rockets. So uh, Elon Musk has been perhaps a little distracted this week with Tesla, but he's got a COO of SpaceX, Gwen Shotwell, running the ship, ship there. As far as you can tell, is everything going to plan, to schedule with getting this first crew launched in April? Uh, I think so. I think um, the development of, um, of the Falcon 9 rocket, uh, as well as the, the Dragon capsule over the last few years, has been steady. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's gone well. Uh, it hasn't had uh, any, any major technical glitches. I believe the, the Boeing uh, capsule, uh, the Starliner, had uh, some, uh, some uh, fuel leaks, I believe. But uh, as far as uh, SpaceX, uh, no, the, this, is, this program has gone uh, on schedule. So there is a lot of doubt as to whether Musk can pull out this Tesla go private plan. But if he can, he has compared the model he aspires to to SpaceX. How do you think Tesla could benefit from SpaceX's private structure? Well, keep in mind that uh, both um, both these companies, Tesla and SpaceX, uh, have entered uh, very conservative, very traditional markets. Uh, Tesla in automobiles, and uh, and SpaceX in, in uh, space launch. Uh, what what SpaceX has done in a very very short period of time in the, in the last ten years has been to uh, to become uh, the world's premier uh, commercial launch company or launch company in general. Uh, to do that in a in a very competitive market in a very short period of time is is nothing uh, less than spectacular. Uh, and he's done it by um, creating products like launch vehicles uh, that are um, very uh, very affordable compared to the competitors by far and very reliable and uh, he's also done it by investing in uh, innovative uh, technologies like reusable uh, t uh, launch vehicle, t vehicle technology so now when they launch uh, Falcons uh, the first stage comes back and lands uh, on its own I think what what happens when you when you're a private company is you don't have shareholders that are looking uh, um, uh, behind you uh, asking, well, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Why isn't the stock price going uh, higher, quicker? I think with a private company, you, you have the luxury of planning for the long term and not worrying about short term, uh, short -term events, short term uh, stock prices. I wonder, though, how Tesla employees will feel about this. You know, SpaceX employees, because it's a private company, they can sell their shares uh, once every six months. But Tesla employees right now can sell them where, whenever they want. You know, what do you imagine the impact for employees will be and how do SpaceX employees like their structure? Well, I can't comment on Tesla. That's not really my area. I'd imagine that, that that's uh, something that they probably wouldn't like. Uh, there are some downsides to going private, but I think uh, on the whole, a uh, private company just is uh, uh, allowed to be uh, much more aggressive, much more innovative. And I think if, um, if he wants to uh, accomplish with Tesla what he's accomplished with SpaceX, I don't think he can really do that as a public company. All right. Marco Casera, Senior Analyst for Space Studies at the Teal Group. Thank you so much for weighing in. Well, Jana Partners disclosed new positions in tech companies, including Facebook and Alibaba. The activist fund run by Barry Rosenstein also took new positions in Microsoft, Alphabet, Grubhub, and DXC Technology. This according to regulatory filings on Tuesday. Jana also exited several high-profile positions, including Bloomin Brands, Northrop Grumman, Keurig, Dr. Pepper, and Cigna.
Coming up, is Google tracking you even when you tell it not to? The ACLU weighs in on the latest battle line in respecting users' privacy. Next, this is Bloomberg. Intel disclosed three flaws in its microchips that could be exploited by malicious actors. The security holes could be used to steal information like passwords and financial records from computer memories by using malware. Now, Intel says the vulnerabilities are known and that fixes are in place. The chipmaker added it would be very hard to exploit these flaws. Well, another day, another big tech firm appearing to violate user privacy. This time, the culprit is Google. The company's smartphone software continues to track your location even after you tell it not to. Now, Google says users can opt out of having their location history tracked all the time, but according to the AP, which originally broke this story, that isn't true, and Google continued to store timestamp locations without permission. Google told Bloomberg that location history is a Google product that is entirely opt-in and users have the controls to edit, delete, or turn it off at any time. We make sure location history users know that when they disable the product. Joining me now from Washington, Nima Singh Guliani, Legislative Counsel for the ACLU. So Nima, these privacy violations unfortunately have become almost routine. How egregious is this one in particular? You know, it's disturbing here that users thought that they were having their location information not collected, um, and that's exactly what Google was doing. But what I think it does is point to really a larger problem, and that's that we don't have comprehensive privacy legislation. Um, we don't have rules for the road that say what companies have to do, what consumers should do if their rights are violated, um, and how, what actions they can expect from the government. So what actions can we expect from the government? Is this something that, you know, legislators, and, and we have lawmakers speaking out on Capitol Hill about this particular issue, but are we going to see real action? Um, we certainly should see real action. I think that there's a debate happening in Congress right now because, as you said, these kinds of privacy violations have become almost routine. Um, we're seeing time after time cases where users expect their information be treated one way, and companies are uh, treating it another way. And a lot of legislators are asking themselves, look, shouldn't consumers be able to expect that they control their data? Shouldn't they be able to have the information and the ability to stop who it's shared with um, and say when it's collected? And that's the very real debate happening right now. Given that there aren't sophisticated enough laws around privacy, are there actual legal implications here to what Google apparently has been doing? Um, certainly. Um, the Federal Trade Commission um, can look at whether Google engaged in deceptive practices. Um, did it say one thing to its consumers and do something else? Um, so that's certainly an option. Um, there may also be uh, state regulators who can take action based on particular state laws. Um, but this is really a problem that's bigger than Google. A couple of months ago, we were talking about Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Um, today, it's Google. Um, tomorrow, it might be another company. Um, but what we need are clear rules. We need a way for consumers to get the information they need to make informed, real decisions. Um, and we need a powerful stick from the government in cases where companies don't act the way they're expected to. I should add that uh, these Google services, according to the AP, are storing this data, whether you're using an Android phone or an iPhone. Do you think that the U.S. needs its own version of GDPR? I mean, Europe has taken certainly a strong stand on the side of user privacy. GDPR is sweeping new regulation. Do you advocate something similar here in the United States? I mean, absolutely. We're really behind the eight ball. Um, especially when we look at what's happening in the European Union. Um, the GDPR regulations, they're not perfect, um, but what they do is they, click, they create standards. Um, they say that consumers are entitled to have information about when their data is stored. They talk about the steps companies have to go through um, to get consent before they can share users' information. Um, and they come with a very heavy stick. In cases where companies violate GDPR, they can be fined up to 4% of their annual global revenue. Um, and so there's a big incentive for companies to follow the GDPR and take steps proactively to ensure that they're not violating consumers' privacy. Meantime, Apple has 
set itself firmly on the side of user privacy, even going so far as to not unlocking the iPhone of a shooting suspect in San Bernardino. Do you think Apple is a company that we can trust? The, the reality is, is that we shouldn't have to rely on the benevolence of a particular company. Um, business practices change over time, um, and certainly different companies have different incentives um, to collect their customers' data. In cases like Google and Facebook, um, they collect data to target ads, and that's a big source of how they make money. Um, but we shouldn't have to rely on a particular company's practices. Um, there should be clear standards in place um, that Congress and our legislatures put in place so that even if a company has a change in their business practices, consumers aren't the ones that pay the price. All right, Nima Singh Guliani of the ACLU, thank you so much for weighing in. Still ahead, Airbnb is not just for individual homes anymore. We're going to take a look at the latest addition to the home sharing startup's rental list. It might surprise you. Next, this is Bloomberg. is investing $375 million into Oscar Health. The company, which has been selling health plans under the Affordable Care Act since 2013, plans to use its funds to fuel its entrance into the market for private health insurance plans for seniors. The investment comes just months after Google's life sciences arm, Verily, participated in a funding round for Oscar. Airbnb isn't just relying on individual renters anymore. It is sharing its own spaces. In partnership with a development company, Airbnb is now opening its first branded building in Nashville, where it will rent out apartments to tourists. The move, following a similar announcement for a Florida complex last year, is part of Airbnb's larger initiative to partner with real estate developers and facility managers who have criticized the startup for allowing illegal subletting. With the developer Nido, the startup plans to launch as many as 14 Airbnb-branded complexes across the country. Here to tell us more, Bloomberg Tech's Olivia Zaleski. So how exactly is this going to work? So this is a fascinating new project that Airbnb is pursuing. They're, they're partnering with this company called Nido, and they're opening these buildings where people live there long term. They have year-long leases. They, they live there normally. And then they also sublet apartments on a short-term basis to tourists. So is this, are these buildings owned or part owned by Airbnb? They're owned by Nido uh -huh. and they license with Airbnb. So it's a partnership. Airbnb gets a 25% cut of what the uh, residents make when they home share. So how do people who live in these buildings already feel about this project? The people I've spoken with are not happy. They're pretty upset. Uh, they feel blindsided, like they didn't agree to live in a hotel. Basically, Nido came in and purchased the buildings. It's going to open as many as 14 buildings by the end of next year. Uh, so some people seem really upset. I did speak to a few people who are excited about the idea. They think it's kind of cool and new, and maybe they just need to warm up to it. And it could also mean a new revenue stream for them, right? Exactly. They can rent out their apartment now whenever they want? Yeah, exactly. And we, so it's a legal sublet that they're doing. Um, but I think people feel a little blindsided by the idea that, you know, the Nido and Airbnb have come in uh, and that essentially they signed a lease without agreeing to live in a hotel, so to speak. Um, but, you know, the company Nido says they're going to work closely with the residents and really help them feel more comfortable with the idea. Is this legal? Like, are there regulatory issues here? I imagine New York City wouldn't be happy about something. Right. So as far as we know, they are not setting one up in New York City. They have one now in, Kiss in Kissimmee, Florida, as well as Nashville, Tennessee, where it is legal. There are, uh, it is legal to home share in this area that they're uh, setting up this building. So what's Airbnb's longer end game here? Are they going to be opening up hotels? You know, that's, it's really interesting. Airbnb says these are not hotels, that the, this is, they're encouraging legal home sharing. Um, but we do understand as we're watching the company really closely that they're moving in that direction to create more hotel-like listings. Earlier this year, they announced Airbnb Plus, which is a hotel-like uh, listing service that they have. You know, they make sure that you have matching towels and matching sheets and that there are amenities in your, in the apartment that you're renting, like a working hairdryer and an iron 
concern. Um, so they're trying to standardize their listings more and appeal to people who want that higher level of service and just that uh, standardization to, to feel like they're getting something that's a little more consistent, like a hotel. Could this go international where there might be fewer regulatory issues? It certainly could. I mean, as far as we know, that there are plans to open up as many as 14 in the U.S. I think that's where they're focused. They're clearly going to areas where there's a high tourist turnover. You know, Nashville is a hot town right now. They're right in this neighborhood that's really popular for music lovers. Um, you know, as far as we know, they're going to open as many as six in Florida. So a lot of movement there. And given the margins, I mean, the, the, this, this particular structure has better margins than your typical Airbnb, right? So how does this fit into IPO plans in 2019, 2020, or beyond? Well, I think this is really a case of Airbnb trying to diversify uh, what it has to offer. You know, they've come under a lot of regulatory pressure, so I think the sentiment internally there is we need to have other products, things where we can make money where there aren't regulatory hurdles. This is legal home sharing. Uh, recently, they opened up experiences, which is you, know, you can take a kayaking lesson or uh, a cooking class. That's another revenue source for them. So I think as they're heading into IPO, they're really thinking about other ways is that they can become, you know, a productive, diversified company. All right. Olivia Zaleski, who covers Airbnb for Bloomberg. Thanks so much. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On tomorrow's show, we're going to be talking Tencent, which is reporting earnings, the Chinese tech giant best known for its popular games and ubiquitous messaging services has shed more than $150 billion in market value since a January peak. Can Tencent change course? We'll discuss. That is all for now. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.